this podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box to this episode. Patreon is a monthly subscription and you can cancel anytime. And PayPal is a one-time donation. Any amount is appreciated. I'm Rania Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. Anne Bernard, a reporter for the New York Times, now covering environment and climate. This moment in time feels different from anything I've seen in my whole life as a reporter. And I have really thought of myself as a reporter since I was a teenager. It's the first time that I've seen uh, friends in countries all around the world, um, sources and leaders and ordinary people in the news and, and personal contacts of mine, basically all going through the same thing and affected by the same major event, this pandemic that is testing all their different societies in different ways. So, you mm-hmm. know, if they're a Syrian refugee who's uh, under bombardment and stuck in a or stuck in a refugee camp or both, uh, the stressors, the the stress test that this pandemic brings to their situation is obviously landing on a much more fragile situation yes. than yes. than it does here in New York City. But, but. Uh, But nonetheless, those factors are impacting everyone and really putting the fragility in each society to to the test. This speaks to the moment that we have we've never met. Uh, We're both in New York. We're both literally blocks away from each other and we're not meeting each other. Thankfully, we're able to do this on Skype. But I think this is it's a quite profound moment. People that are forced to kind of uh, readjust to in, in every way possible. And I, I know that from your own experience, you've, you, you've had sort of, you know what lockdown feels like. Can you take me back 15, 16 years ago in, in Baghdad when you were reporting from Iraq? Is this sort of a bit of deja vu for you, not being able to kind of roam the streets or be at, 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 at ease and, and being outside? Does this have any snippets of that? Yes, it absolutely does, especially um, a couple of weeks ago when uh, it first started to really hit New York. And um, I was the first one in our family to start working at home. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, of course, married to Thanasi, who uh, he and I were co-bureau chiefs uh, of the Boston Globe in Baghdad mm-hmm. uh, immediately after the uh, the invasion by the U.S. of Iraq in 2003. And we lived there for two years uh, in the Hamra Hotel uh, mm-hmm. which was not in the green zone. It was what the Americans called the red zone, just the rest of Iraq. But it was uh, in, in downtown Baghdad in the Jadria neighborhood. And yes. a lot of journalists lived there. And, you know, for the first few months, um, we were able to come and go and travel all over um, Iraq. We drove to places that later became sort of bywords for conflict, like Fallujah, Ramadi, Najaf. Um, And, of course, there was some hostility towards Americans because people weren't happy with the invasion and occupation. But, you know, people recognized that we were journalists and we were there to sort of tell the truth about what was happening and to um, maybe uh, correct some of the misimpressions and lies that were coming out of official sources. And and our job was to be there on the ground. And so they did want to talk to us once they understood that. Um, But eventually, within by the time we had actually sort of permanently moved ourselves to Iraq and had had put our stuff in storage and we no longer had an apartment anywhere else in the world, Um, we thought we'd continue living like that. And everything changed within just a few weeks, really. Um, Some uh, isolated attacks, uh, snipers killed a couple of journalists, Iraqi journalists that were working for foreigners and started Mm. to try to kidnap foreigners. And then Two insurgencies broke out simultaneously in in uh, western west of Baghdad in Anbar province and to the south in Najaf and then in Sadr city and suddenly within really the space of three or four weeks uh, the situation was so transformed that there were times when we spent you know entire weeks uh, not going out um, right sometimes right. more 
And so we had this sense of claustrophobia. And at that time, it was because we as international journalists specifically and any Iraqis working with us were being actively hunted by insurgents who, who wanted to uh, attack anyone that could be associated with the occupation or kidnap those people for money. Um, and so our fear, so there are some very interesting parallels here. I mean, first of all, I was the first one to start working at home here in New York. And right. I suddenly felt that I was back in that room, suite 606 of the Hamra <laughs> Hotel, which wow. is the origin story of our marriage, really. I mean, we were just, you know, sort of dating and we, we had to explain to the Boston Globe that, yes, we could manage to be co-bureau chiefs and we would still keep doing the job even if we broke up. And um, <laughs> and we then we immediately were like in this war and, and, and sort of confined occasionally to this room or in other kinds of crazy situations. But now here I was in, the, in our apartment in Brooklyn, which is about the size of of that uh, two-room hotel suite in the in yeah. the uh, Hamra Hotel, and and in fact, we still have some dishes that say the Hamra Hotel on them, um, which I liberated from the Hamra wow. Hotel when when I left after two years, um, and uh, and then the next day, Thanasi was there with me in the room, and the kids were out at school. New York yes. hadn't closed the schools yet, so right. it was like right. somehow the kids are venturing out into what, in this analogy, is the insurgency. And coming back home where we're staying inside because we've been told to work from home. And so that was just a strange moment in the disjointed response by the New York authorities in, in how to how to respond. And the other thing is that part of the reason we didn't go out when we were in Baghdad during those periods was because of the fear that we would endanger others. You know, in other right. words, that right. because we were foreigners, if we went into like a crowded marketplace to talk yes. to some Iraqis, or if we went to someone's house, or even if our translator was seen with us, then we'd be endangering that person. We would be giving them the contagion of, of being uh, connected with, with the occupation. Wow. And so we had to like pause and think about what's worth it. And if we're going to go visit one someone, how are we going to do that? How are we going to plan for that in a way that it doesn't harm them? So that was reminiscent that we were staying inside because we want to stop the spread. We don't want to be a vector. So yeah. now we have all four of us here in the apartment. So it's like the Hamra, but with kids. That's crazy. So it's really come full circle in a sense that you're in a way able to re-experience what was a very testing time in your in your professional career. Of course, there's that nice love story as well that you're meeting your future husband during that madness. And here you are, almost two decades later, able to kind of re-experience it in in a, in a different way. But I, but I like that you you see that you you're able to posit yourself as almost the carrier, tw uh, almost 20 years ago, that you would potential threat to the local population. And we're all going through this right now in various degrees. We're all in a way able to threaten each other, which is which is really insane. If you can take me back to the the years afterwards, so I mean, we all know the story. We all know the the aftermath. We know what what the invasion did to Iraq and and the occupation. And there's that endless debate that we don't need to get into. But just from your own eyes, having seen what's happened, of course, not just in Iraq, but in that part of the world in general, the, before the coronavirus, that upswell of emotion that took over Lebanon, Iraq, and to sort of various extent, Iran as well. The protests that we were watching, whether we were there or abroad, where you had the masses sort of going to the streets, demanding domestic reform. It, it almost seemed like the geopolitics were not directly part of the story for the first time. Did, did that yes. stand out to you? Yes, that was also a really amazing moment. I mean, at that time, and, it, you know, it's interesting how these moments sort of happen on the turns of the decades, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, to, 2001 was 9-11, followed shortly by the invasion of Iraq. It was sort of the inauguration of everything being seen through the lens of a of the so-called war on terror, which I think mm -hmm. is just a ridiculous name, of course, and has been a, a flawed policy. But, um, but uh especially because the terror had nothing to do with Iraq, as we know. But but anyway, um, yeah, so then in 2010, late 2010, early 2011, when, um, when the uprisings and revolts started to happen around the Arab world, it was a positive kind of contagion, I think, uh, for many people, many young, you know, civil society people or young working people, uh, people who, who really thought that 
that their lives were going to be stuck in stagnation, um, both in terms mm -hmm. of their working prospects and their civil liberties. And when they saw people like themselves around the region, you know, having the courage to sort of challenge this and ask sort of on their own terms for um, for something different. And you know, they would see it happen in one place after another where they never could have believed it happened. And then they thought, well, maybe it'll happen here. And I've heard that so many times from the people who lived through it. Right. Um, and it seemed like maybe that was going to be a pivot point that we would pivot away from the so-called war on terror as the lens through which we saw the whole world and especially the the Middle East and the Arab world. Um, and it would be it would become something more about citizenship and, and dignity and, and, you know, figuring out how to change systems so that they're more responsive to the people living in them, whether it's in the Middle East or in the West. You know, maybe the West was going to learn something from these movements. Right. Um, and then, of course, it hasn't felt that way. It, instead, it has felt that it's just through very complicated forces, including misinformation and suppression and torture and, uh, you know, the failure of the UN and the international system and all kinds of other factors and the failure of international law that you could say may, maybe started with the war on terror and, and the war in Iraq um, and, and, you know, what came full circle. In any case, for all these for, for the reasons of all these different intersecting forces, what we had was just all those uh, revolts being subsumed again into a narrative that really stuck with the war on terror, where the right. dictators right. use that. You know, is that also some kind of contagion? Maybe. Um, in, in any case, um, we didn't see a pivot. And what I see now is that our pivot is actually going to be from the war on terror to the era of, of really coming face to face with pandemics and maybe with climate change as well. And yes. what I really fear is that is that unfortunately we will meet those challenges we as the world i'm not talking about the united states or lebanon or you know yes, i'm talking yes. more generally will meet those challenges with attitudes institutions and divisions and fragilities that are born of the war on terror unfortunately so that's, what, what, that's what's alarming so, so i'm getting this right that there is a potential risk here that the aftermath of the coronavirus may actually lead to another sort of disappointment in terms of getting the what what should what was sort of, sort of started a decade ago the sort of the Arab Spring and this account for this this real test towards accountability and and reform and dignity that the coronavirus may actually put that off for years to come. Am I getting that right? That we were at risk here that this may actually be another round of disappointment. I think there is a risk like that because of all these sort of systems and habits of thought and governmental modus operandi that we've acquired through the war on terror and through the uh -huh. suppression of the Arab revolts, um, that th there's a playbook that, you know, authoritarian leaders seem to like, whether they're in the West or the East. Um, I mean, of course, people are seeing a big potential here, you know, that, it, yes, it's horrible, but maybe this will bring people to see that major things need to be changed about our societies, about yes. the way we divide labor and wealth and the way we uh, take care of, of our most vulnerable and, and all those different issues that these different societies are, are dealing with. The, the coronavirus lays bare everything that should change about those things. Um, but at the same time, there's a playbook in place that involves, you know, convincing people that there's an enemy outside and that we need to build walls and that we need to fear the other and that we need to uh, surveil people. And, you know, all the, you know, that it's very potent on both. There, there's potent energy on each side. And, yes. and I think I think whether we're talking about pandemics or whether we're talking about an inevitable wave of climate-driven conflict and migration, mm -hmm. um, the, the, that next sort of stressor that, that follows the war on terror is going to unfortunately still have that playbook in mind. So I think it will take a lot of uh, effort from, from people that are thinking differently to counteract that and offer something more compelling or, or more powerful in its place. You know, I, I from having spent the last four or five months in Beirut, and I was sort of uh, watching the the events unfold, and and the protests were were almost a uh, like a a magical moment in time that was so unexpected, and it was coming at a time of severe economic stress, 
uh, environmental de- degradation in Lebanon and almost a, a, a regime that seemed um, unreformable, that you can't really do anything. You're stuck with what you have in Lebanon. And out of nowhere, there's this moment of euphoria, people going to the streets and, and genuinely challenging authority without any any international uh, slogan, without any uh, external flag. And for me, that was quite special. And I always sensed at the beginning of that, that these things need to happen quickly. And time is always important, that you can't wait too long for a revolution to take hold and for a revolution to actually achieve structural change. Does that resonate with you in any way in terms of having covered this part of the world and seen it sort of attempt over and over to yield positive change? Is time a critical factor? And and I'll give you a, a more uh, concrete example that the streets are deserted, not because the protesters are, ha- gave up, but literally because another issue took hold. This time it's the coronavirus. Is the, and we have a regime that seems to be able to cope with the with the current crisis in, in place. Is there anything about time that that time is critical for for yielding positive change? As you were saying that, I was literally counting on my fingers going six months. I was there. Uh, also, I was lucky enough to be there in November, and yeah, I couldn't believe how exciting it was in the sense that, you know, so many years after um, the Arab revolts and in in Lebanon, where everyone, it was sort of a a conventional wisdom that you can't have an Arab revolt in Lebanon, but it was was precisely because it was Lebanon and because of the anti-sectarian approach that that made it feel new and it even resonated with Iraq and to some extent with Iran. I mean, that was, you know, seeing it go back to where it all began in Iraq was almost even more amazing for me, the bravery of, of the people in Iraq that were standing up to, to right. their government. I think, um, f- first of all, in fairness, nobody imagined the idea of a pandemic where literally, you know, we're not talking about a political metaphor here, literally gathering in large crowds becomes dangerous. So right. the government couldn't dream of such a boon, you know, <laughs> that they don't have to exercise violence or, or anything is crazy. It just, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. Um, but actually it was already under stress because the currency crisis caught up to the revolution. And, and you know, a, again, just as uh, previous uh, leaders under threat used the, the, the idea of terrorism as a, as a get out of jail free card, right. the elites in Lebanon tried to blame the currency crisis on the, the revolution, which, of course, it, the currency crisis was going to happen with or without the revolution and was maybe one of the reasons that the revolution started, because people could see the economic collapse coming. So um, anyway, they use this trick again. But I think, um, I think, yeah, that there is something about time and the time cuts both ways, because on one hand, um, it seems when we look in hindsight that that these movements, if you go back to Tahrir Square and others, they ended up spending a lot of time sort of in committees discussing things and having more and more protests and uh, sort of having a protest party and, and all this stuff right. without building structures. And and yes, that's part of it. But at the same time, I also can see that that it also takes a much longer time horizon than anyone thinks of. Unfortunately, in there's just no other way to look at it. Now, you hear the, those uh, Syrian and Egyptian um, activists and, and thinkers that that were active back in 2011, and those that are managed to still be alive are are um, talking about how to make societal change on a clock of generations. So, right. right. I don't think anyone has figured out the formula, I mean, but I think that, that the way that Leban- Lebanese and Iraqi and Sudanese protesters tried to learn from attempts of the past was really, really interesting, you know, and, and why won't they continue to do that? Now, you know, I actually I'm going to maybe take this one step further from, from your own analysis, having sort of looked at this issue in terms of the challenges to the average person today in the Middle East, and they're stacked up. I mean, you have economic challenges, you have individual citizenship issues, there's social pacts that are being maybe uh, they reached their expiration date. People are calling on a new social pact in, in different countries. These issues that all seem to be domestic at heart, where it's literally people challenging their respective rulers. 
Is there a geopolitical component today, in your mind, at least what's happening in Lebanon and Iraq and, and to a degree in Iran, that the geopolitics remain, in a sense, front and center to the story? Or are they less important today, that it's really just a matter of locals achieving local demands? I mean, looking back two decades ago, all we talked about was geopolitics, geopolitics, geopolitics. And it's not just Iraq, of course, even in 2005 and in, in Lebanon, the story was about Syria and Lebanon. And mm -hmm. that was always a geopolitical story. Um, ten years ago, the narrative shifted, where it became the Arab Spring sort of uh, citizenry looking within as opposed to looking outside. But at the same time, do you still think of the geopolitical quagmire that many countries face in that part of the world as, in a way, front and center to, to the challenges of the average person trying to change their countries from within? Yes, because what we saw in the Arab Spring was not the geopolitical meddling that people tried to simplistically posit, you know, by, by you know, some people said these protests are invented by George Soros or by the State Department or something like this. Of course, that, that wasn't true, but yes. but it was true that the outcomes um, were, were um, affected in different countries by the degree to which uh, the United States and Europe and, and Russia and Iran were, were willing to play cards. Um, and of course, in Syria, it was the worst possible outcome. Um, yes. with too many uh, interventions on all sides. And with the one uh, that was more willing to, to go the distance was the one on, on behalf of Assad by, by Iran and Russia. And, um, and I think that it's inescapable that, that geopolitics played a role in the outcome there. And, mm -hmm. and I think, um, you know, we're in an era of a big question mark about this because we don't know if there is going to be four more years of Trump. Um, we don't know if literally we, we, we may be at such a big inflection point right now. I mean, even if we spoke four weeks later than today, you and I could could have more perspective on this. Are we actually looking at an inflection point that marks the end of, you know, so-called U.S. greatness or dominance? I mean, the right. fact that the U.S., is perhaps poised on having the worst coronavirus um, outcome in the Western world because right. of um, avoidable mismanagement. Um, right. what, what, how serious of an inflection point is that for the U.S.'s interest or ability to project power one way or another? And then Trump has shown a sort of fluctuating level of interest in, in being involved in anything geopolitical and certainly in, in he's certainly not very interested in supporting democracy movements. Um, I think geopolitics themselves are in flux right now, both with the collapse of uh, as, as hypocritically and, and inconsistently enforced as they may have been, the international norms that were set up after World War II. Uh, to sort of keep warfare in check and to to have some kinds of sets of rules and cooperation for governments to deal with each other. All that was thrown out quite explicitly in Syria um, yes. in ways yes. that are affecting the rest of the world. And um, we may be seeing some of that hangover in the uh, disjointed sort of lack of, of uh, global cooperation so far on coronavirus. So... Right. I think all of this is going to shake out maybe over the coming year, whether Trump is reelected, how seriously hit by coronavirus the United States and its institutions are, mm -hmm. um, is a factor. And do you do you sense, and this is going a bit before the Trump era, that there has been a, an, a, a genuine disinterest on the American side towards the outcome of these protest movements? And that includes, of course, Syria, where you have passionate protesters calling on things that largely resonate in America and the West, calling for things that in a, in a way should line up in terms of values and, and things that in a way the Americans were struggling to sell two decades ago. Is there a disinterest in, in at least the, the, the democratic passion on the streets today in the Middle East that it's just they don't really at this point care so much about democracy per se? I think it's it's clear that that there was that it, certainly in terms of the general public, uh, the unfortunate effect of the war on terror years and uh, the simplistic way that that most people absorbed the lessons of those years um, w was was to 
really um, detract from the ability of average Americans to identify with people in the Middle East. Mm. Um, I yeah. think, unfortunately, it's 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 the Islamophobia and and the the, the sense that um, Arabs or Muslims are somehow uniquely dangerous and scary was a, a wrong. Um, conclusion that that many people drew perhaps understandably if they if they were absorbing only a little bit of media or some very uh uh shrill media um but yeah. you know part of it is just that that you know it was complicated it was the other it was people over there yeah you know complicated conflicts that go back generations i mean that's the kind of label that was put on it and right. and so so people i think that the public had really just washed its hands of the region. Um, it's it's ironic because back then, and going again, going back to this feeling of claustrophobia, I think that the theme of claustrophobia hangs over everything we're talking about here, both yeah. the way people feel in the region, you know, that they're sort of stuck in their domestic dramas in these little countries that yeah. that, that, that seem so disconnected from from the global trends, but yet there is a trend that unites them all, which is this struggle between the um, you know, ossified power structure and the and the young, um, and then at the same time, I go back to my claustrophobia at the Hamra Hotel in in Baghdad. It it was incredibly frustrating. We would go out. We would eventually make a plan. We would go out. We would uh, have our Iraqi colleagues take risks with us to report. We would have sources take risks with us. We would go and and embed with with troops in in battles and then we would also go unembedded and travel around on our own kind of trying to lay low and and dress like locals and not be noticed and every yeah. time we left the apartment we were afraid that there was going to be a suicide bombing or some kind of random bombing or some kind of kidnapping or we would be caught up in some kind of military confrontation and you know it's hard to remember like how much that level of tension we lived with every single day. And so did many Iraqis for many more years than we did. Um, and, and what did I get out of all that? What was I doing there? What was my mission as a journalist? It was to, um, to, to tell people that, okay, uh, you know, you're hearing one thing from from the White House. You're hearing that, you know, this was about WMD, or you're hearing that this, that this is a well-run sort of temporary occupation that's going to make everything better in Iraq. You're hearing that we're bringing democracy, and and you know, every single thing you're seeing on the ground, it was almost like a journalist's dream. You could just report on what's happening in front of you at any point, and it would right. be just uh, very eye-opening to anyone. Um, and I remember being so shocked when I spent in an even more claustrophobic situation um, in, in the Battle of Fallujah, the first of many, um, uh, where there were two rounds of it in 2002, one in the spring and one in the fall. But in, in, the, in the fall, going around inside a Bradley fighting vehicle, so it's like, you, know, you feel like you can hardly breathe in there and you're right, with right. The, some 19-year-old uh soldiers and the back of the door drops and you jump out and you're trying to run for cover and, you know, just see what's going on in the middle of this battle, you know, going through that, um, and just around the same time, uh, seeing that George W. Bush was reelected that same month, um, yes. was as if, you know, the public is, is not getting it. You know, uh, it's not, you know, that we're, we're, we're finding out all this information and it's not having an impact. Of course, it does have an impact because you are, you know, everyone says that journalism is the rough draft of history. It's really true. You're gathering data and anecdotes and, and you know, um, uh, context for people's understanding of things in the future. And eventually people did get the message that the invasion of Iraq and the occupation of Iraq were both a mistake in the first place and poorly run and, and, you know, harmed Iraq and the United States. And, and people did get that, did absorb that as sort of as, as the American public. And that was basically as far as they were willing to think about anything else to do with the Middle East. So, right. so, so I think politically it was very difficult for Obama to, to, if, if he, if he had wanted to sell to the American people, you know, we should have some kind of like, you know, responsibility to protect response in Syria. It would have been a hard sell because it, there's a lag between when people start to understand something and and when it 
the information is first available. Um, but I, I'll, I'll sort of uh, flip this on its head. And do, do you sense that this may, this may be an unintended good thing where you have protesters in the Middle East now that don't rely on American support per se? And, and in other words, that they, they're not asking or waiting for external support to achieve their demands, that they're literally doing it on their own against all odds, and they may, they may not get there. But is that perhaps a, um, a positive development in that the onus is now on the local population? Well, exactly. And I think it always was. I mean, I think I think that one of the mistakes that happened in, in the handling of, of the Arab revolts was, uh, you know, a two sided mistake. One one was uh, of, um, you know, the Arab publics maybe expecting more overt help than they were really going to get. And yeah. also um, and also sometimes I say that that the Obama people um, did the opposite of what Teddy Roosevelt said. His famous maxim was that uh, a great power should um, speak softly and carry a big stick. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't mean that, that you should use the stick. It just means that, 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 uh, that, it, it, yeah, at that least you, you have the power and it's a credible threat. Right. Um, and whereas uh, in, in Syria, it seems that, that the United States spoke loudly and carried a very small stick. So raised, yes. um, Con- raised hopes uh, on the part of people that that thought the U.S. would help the democracy movement, um, raised fears on the part of the regime that made it perhaps act in a more, um, you know, uh, uh, desperate way um, than it, than other options could have been presented, and yes. and and also did not follow up on its threats. Therefore, you know, seeming to give a green light to to um, all kinds of human rights violations as well right, as right. you know some people argue even Russia's moves in the Ukraine in Ukraine. So I think that was one problem but you know I also think so I think in the first place it it was a mistake for anyone to to think that the US was going to take care of this for them um, yes. uh, although the US sort of helped give them that impression also by some of the public statements that were not fully disciplined right. um but uh, but I also think yes, absolutely. Sometimes sometimes I think of this counterfactual. What if there had been no invasion of Iraq? What if there had been um, no sort of claim on the part of George W. Bush to be bringing democracy to Iraq? Maybe the whole idea of democracy wouldn't have been tainted with this U.S. Uh, uh, meddling kind of kind of flavor. Maybe right. uh, the, the the period of the Arab Spring would have gone differently. You know, it would have arisen yes. differently if there hadn't been an invasion of Iraq. And maybe that's the era we're entering now. Let's hope that we could be entering an era now where, you know, uh, in the absence of, of a sort of a loud U.S. voice in the region, um, some organic things can can well up and maybe not have the same sort of automatically um, uh, geopolitically fraught uh, reactions that right. they would have these protests that we're seeing today are perhaps delayed in history due to events like the invasion of Iraq, or more, more so the outcome of that invasion, that it may have yes. actually d- delayed the inherent need for reform in these countries, sort of put it on pause. It probably even, as you said, it damaged, it damaged words that should not be damaged, like, like democracy. And, you know, you took me back for a moment in time to 2012, I was on my rooftop in Ashrafiya. This is, uh, I think, maybe hours after the line in the sand speech by Obama, after the chemical attack and the first of series of chemical attacks in Syria. Mm-hmm. I just remember many people, myself included, looking up at the sky and waiting to see these lights, sort of these yes. these rockets landing in Syria. And to me, that's that's a double-edged sword. Yes. Because you don't want to rely on American might. And then the other side is, of course, you want the Syrians to be able to be to be able to do it on their own as well. And no support whatsoever kind of creates an extreme situation, which is what we had the last decade, where they were literally left to their own. And they just just not it's not that they're just fighting the Assad regime. They're fighting a very, very big machine that has in a way curtailed 
the ambitions of several countries, including including the Syrians. And that that takes me back to what you said earlier about claustrophobia. You know, I think every euphoric moment, and in, in at least my memory in Beirut, is when there's a sense of breaking free from that siege mentality. And Lebanon is a small country. <laughs> Beirut is a small town. It's very, very claustrophobic. But those mm-hmm. moments, for a moment, you feel like you're connected to something bigger. And I want to ask you for about connectivity today as opposed to 15, 16, 17 years ago in Iraq. Covering the coronavirus now, the fact that we're doing this through Skype is, is not so new. But in terms of just sh- this, this way of reporting, social media kind of being the delivery and everyone using social media today in ways that were not known before, do you, do you sense that in a way we're experiencing the, these crises differently on an emotional scale, that we're in a way the coronavirus today impacts us more on a personal, emotional, almost a, a mental health way that it might not have earlier. Does does it feel on a on a reporting side that in a way the connectivity is so so strong now that we're all in this together, whether we're in New York or Beirut or Baghdad or China? Yes, I think absolutely. It's it's incredible, and it has both uh, pluses and minuses for sort of our our. Um, global political health and our um and our personal mental health it really does i mean i mean and i think that the arab revolts can can take credit for um for driving this change it's a global change and i think the arab revolts were a turning point in how social media could actually drive a movement and also could be a tool for citizen journalists or just citizens to yes. record what's happening to them and to document uh, violations against their civil or human rights. Um, right. And we saw the people in Wuhan um, documenting things that the Chinese authorities didn't want to come out about the right. the doctors right. who tried to protest about the, uh, who tried to raise the alarm about how badly uh, things were going inside the city, about some of the measures being taken. Um, this is uh, really a revolution in communication. And, and of course, there are ways that, that social media can be used for disinformation, but it also really connects people. It lets people feel more together. It lets people feel less isolated. Um, it lets people get their stories out. And we can't talk about claustrophobia and conflict and, and danger and, uh, and uh, health uh, threats without talking about the sieges during the war in Syria, you know, with, right. with right. towns and neighborhoods completely surrounded, under bombardment, in many cases, actual starvation happening, uh, deprivation of basic health care. Um, people were still able to feel connected on some level to the world. Right. And right. to, to get out their stories and, and video evidence and, you know, photographs that could be geolocated to prove what they're seeing was really happening and right. and all this kind of stuff. Now we're seeing that with the coronavirus and the the the, the um, it does create a sense of community and it does help us share information. It also mm-hmm. can help share misinformation and it also can can make the emotional impact almost more than human beings can bear because um, for me (laughs) as a journalist, I'm sure you have experienced this as well. um, You know, we've all seen a certain number of terrible things in our lives. And even if we are people who engage a lot with conflict and with difficult situations and, you know, cover people that have been through traumatic things, there's only a finite number of of times that you're face to face with death, let's say, or or um, other kind of extreme situations. But when you multiply that by the um, number of videos of, of dying children or or uh, dying sick people or doctors in tears saying that they don't have any equipment, whether it's a doctor in Aleppo who's under siege or a doctor in Italy who doesn't have enough ventilators, right. you know, it, you're not only dealing with what you've experienced yourself, but you're dealing with with the, the, the like the infinite quantity of grief and, and fear and trauma all around the world. And even right. like a person in Aleppo who's just seen his family killed by a bomb, he's also got a smartphone and he's also reading about the person in Idlib and the person in Ruta. And, you know, how much can a person take? You know? Exactly, exactly. And it's not that this is sporadic. I mean, this is constant. It's It's almost by the second. We're being flooded with that kind of emotional, it's it's pain. And it's a shared pain that we, uh, I think it does have its toll in terms of, 
It's the downside to feeling so connected that we're sharing everything all the time. And not everything is positive. I mean, there's a lot of negative that is shared, and we all suffer to a degree from it. And I like the way you, you described it, that you can handle a few terrible incidents, but maybe throughout your life. It doesn't have to be on a daily basis, especially when someone, and, and your your example is, is fitting here, someone who covers a dangerous terrain and is seeing a lot of that pain up front, that's definitely not, that's not a healthy thing. <laughs> so you don't want to have the whole world kind of suffering together in a way that may, and I, I always wonder if that's, that may also play a role in, in sh people shying away from things that they wouldn't otherwise. We saw the euphoria on, on October 17, 18, and 19 and in Lebanon, and that was an Instagram experience. I think Lebanese throughout the world were sharing their images and videos on Instagram and, and Twitter and Facebook, but it was really a photo-heavy uh, sharing people confronting authority, and it was a positive message. Two months later, you have images of tear gas and these uh, uh, almost the, these rubber bullets and eyes being taken out and, and blood. And then suddenly you have this reverse reaction, which is people are less – they're more reluctant to go back to the street and keep demanding for change. It almost, it almost exaggerates the emotion of the time. It amplifies things. Right, right. And maybe, maybe when people are dealing with a the flood, they end up – uh, you know, oversimplifying, you know, just in order right. to process it, you know. So right. an another example of that is how, um, you know, people in Europe on some level seemed to process that the war in Syria is terrible. A lot of atrocities are happening. Now all these Syrians are coming to our country. They must be bringing the bad things. Exactly. You know, inst exactly. Instead, of, instead of connecting it that these people are fleeing the bad things, it, it was all in one basket for them. You know, there's violence there. We don't want these violent people here. Um, and because I think that the, on, on one level, yes, people should be more responsible in how they analyze things. But on the other hand, it, there's an overload. You know, there is an overload. And, I, and the question, I think, goes back to what you said earlier. Is there like a sweet spot in the amount of time or the amount of momentum that that positive movements can have? Like, is there a sweet spot also in the, in the amount of... Um, emotion they trigger because because this right. kind of social connection social media connection does connect people and then when it becomes overload then it numbs people so exactly yes so how to calibrate that is a really interesting question you know for yes. people that are trying to get something done uh you know I, i'm reminded of a, of a film called no man's land i don't know if that sounds familiar it's a movie about uh bosnia you have mm -hmm. a Serb, a Croat, and a Bosniak fighter stuck together in a trench, and they're they're watching each other, they're shooting at each other, but this is maybe a year into the conflict. Uh, one of the soldiers gets a newspaper, and as they're shooting each other, sort of uh, looks to his uh, friend and says, "Oh my God, look what's happening to Rwanda." <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but but that is that's 25 years ago, and then today. I mean, this is happening all the time. It's second by second, and it's uh, it's difficult to kind of switch that off. But Anne, I uh, I first of all, I want to thank you for letting me speak to you during this pandemic. Um, and I know that we aim to meet one day in person. Hopefully, in the coming weeks, this will in a way, ease and the social distancing will be less so. Maybe it's too early to say. But it was it was a pleasure speaking to your husband a few a few weeks ago, and I hope that we can uh, we can carry this conversation through once this crisis uh, lessens. And uh, really, I appreciate your perspective on many things because I don't know I don't know many people that have covered the Middle East and are now covering coronavirus. It is kind of amazing. I mean, just to be to have moved back from Beirut after living there for you know six years, um, and to have moved back here with my family about a year and a half ago, and um, and my kids are taking this all in stride. I mean, we somehow thought we were, we would bring them to a place that was more stable and and more more quiet. And you know what they've seen is you know politics here that are getting more and more ugly. That they actually. Think a lot about, even though they're quite small, and um, and now this uh, this coronavirus is is having us shelter inside the house to a degree that we never did have to in Beirut. You know, we did have a contingency plan. You know, what if uh, war came to the streets of Beirut and um, 
uh, and we did uh, think about what we would do. In fact, uh, we thought maybe Thanasia and the kids would move to Athens and I would come on the weekends to visit them, as right. many people right. did during the Civil War. <laughs> It never <laughs> happened. It never happened. And, and now we're sheltering in place, you know, here in New York. So it, it just shows you that, that uh, you know, there's no boundaries to any of these things that can happen. I will just tell you uh, something personal, if you don't mind, uh, you know, I apologize even for bringing it up. But um, when your father uh, was killed, um, actually, it was the first moment that um, that the that that I started to ask myself if we were reaching that predetermined moment, you know, because we had to basically say to ourselves in advance, you, we, we were like, listen, we know we're going to get used to whatever the hell happens. So let's decide in advance, what is the circumstance that will cause us to remove our children from Beirut? Because if we just leave it to feeling in the moment, we'll be like the frog in boiling water and we won't uh, ever leave. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah. set it for ourselves when the bombs if, the, if, if there start to be bombs or attacks that are causing us to vary our daily life, like the way we walk to school or the way we go to the office. Yeah. Um, and that happened. Um, uh, we were at home. We lived on America Street at that time, just a block down from where Walid Jimblat lives. Yes, and uh, yes. although it's quite far from downtown, I mean, far enough, like the windows rattled. And my mother-in-law was visiting and um, she met my eyes and I was like, oh, my God. And she and she said to the kids, I think it's thunder. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's thunder. But actually, at that one horrible moment, that was the closest that it came to our life. Um, so yeah. anyway, I really I like it. And um, and, uh, you know, we really need to meet sometime because I. I of course. So much interested in your story and your your uh, approach to Beirut and and to the politics and I've been listening as a fan to the podcast. Um, no, but thank you for sharing this this uh, the, what you just said because um, you know we, the what, the way you're describing it that moment where you make a decision to disconnect and sort mm -hmm. of let go. Uh, this is a very it's a silly way of of in my in my own life. I, I used to give a tour in Beirut, a history mm -hmm. tour, walking tour of Beirut. Yes. And I, I, I really, that for me was, it was always a, uh, if, if there was a bombing in Beirut itself, I would stop giving the tour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for the life of me, I never thought that it would be that kind of ending to the tour. Oh that, my God. You know, yes. The bombing would be my father. That this never, I never made that kind of connection. Of course not. <laughs> right, and I and I ran away. I I left for a few years, and I I came back. I came back only when it felt okay to come back. It was four years mm -hmm. later, mm -hmm. but it's but it's it's something that I mean what what you're saying. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's mm -hmm. it's very hard to let go of a bad situation, mm -hmm. and you kind of are drawn back to it regardless at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And you see, you came back and you engaged with that exact situation in your exactly. like new version of the tour. So, yeah, exactly. so there exactly. you go, you know. Well, I do hope we meet in person soon uh, in New York or Beirut. And um, thank you so much for having me. My pleasure, and thank you. Thanks for listening. And a friendly reminder to help support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box below. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>